last time on the Skip and Josh podcast. I think you're going to agree with me on this. A- I, did you watch on ABC? I did. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I watched not. I watched on. I flipped back and forth, but yeah, I watched for the most part ABC. My son says it's not real if you didn't watch it on ABC. I believe him. <laughs> I, I, I stand by that. You're listening to the Skip and Josh podcast with Skip Sherman and Josh Obadia. I'm Josh in Toronto, and I'm Skip in Montreal. In today's episode, breaking NHL trades interesting moments from the NBA draft, and highlights from the NHL awards. But first, baseball in Montreal? Okay, Skippy, it's time for another episode of the Skip and Josh podcast. I am extremely annoyed today about so many things, so I may raise my voice at multiple times during this episode. Literally, we've been on the phone for only two minutes before we push record. So, and you just said to me, I'm so annoyed. And then I'm like, well, what? And then you're like, oh, there's too many things. So now are we going to hear about them? Or You'll hear about some of them. <laughs> Major League Baseball. So I think we have to start with uh, this story about the Tampa Bay Rays getting permission to explore the possibility of splitting their home games between Tampa and Montreal. And the minute I heard about this, actually you had texted me, but I had heard about it before that. The yeah. minute I heard about this, I already didn't like it. There are so many holes in this idea, and I'm going to go through all of them right now. So Bill Simmons used to do his podcast when he was affiliated with ESPN. And they used to have around once a month or once every two months, he used to have one of his buddies on. And they used to do this show called Half-Baked Ideas. And they used to come up with like just weird ideas that completely weren't thought through, that they seem like good ideas, but when you really think about them, they're completely nonsense. <laughs> this has to be the most half-baked of half-baked ideas I've ever heard. Well, I've, I- heard, I've heard stranger ideas than this, or crazier ideas than this. Yeah. But, but let me get into the reasons why this will never work. Okay. So, so basically, let's assume that Major League Baseball approves this and the Tampa City Council approves this, and the Montreal City Council approves this, which all that happening is, you know, a long shot. But let's just say it happens. Yeah. So then you're telling me that now both these cities have to build brand new stadiums and spend millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, that's where this whole thing is doesn't make sense. To play fewer games than they would have if they had a full-time team. Yeah. Now, already, already a baseball stadium, if you build it properly, cannot really be used for anything else. It's not like a hockey arena that you can have concerts in and stuff like that, and you can play basketball games also. A baseball stadium, if it's a proper baseball stadium, especially in in the city of Montreal, when the Expos aren't playing or whatever the the name of the team would be, what are you going to do in an outdoor baseball stadium in December? Nothing. You can't. So you're building this thing hopefully to play 81 baseball games. And now you're telling them that they're only going to play 40 40. or 60. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense in that regard. The thing that doesn't make sense is that teams have enough trouble (laughs) finding, finding ways to finance new stadiums. Tampa has been trying to get a new stadium forever because their stadium is garbage and they know it and they can't get out of their lease and the, and, and you know, we've heard all these stories about cities holding uh, gov- local governments hostage so they can get funding for stadiums. And I think local governments now are weary of this ploy. And they're, it, the, the, amount, the, the local governments that are going to fall for this are few and far between. So, like, h- how are two cities supposed to finance stadiums? Two ownership groups supposed to finance new stadiums, let alone one, which is almost an impossible thing. Yeah, you used the word ploy, and that's exactly what this is. It's a ploy by the Tampa owner to put pressure on the city of Tampa to build a new stadium. And let me ask you this question. So, yeah. again, let's say everyone approves this plan, and I don't know if I could call well, it Well, I mean, there is no plan. It's right. just an idea. Right. So we don't, we're speculating on what the details could be, but we really don't know, right? Okay. I mean, but what Tampa, what the owner of the Tampa Bay Rays is trying to do is get the city officials to build a new stadium. So if they agree to build this new stadium in a different location, then he's got what he wants. Why does he even need Montreal at that point? The article that I read there, I read many articles about this, but they're saying that an, a covered stadium is too expensive. Agree. So, so they could, they could drastically reduce the price of a new stadium in Tampa. If they build an outdoor, uh, an open air stadium, the problem with an open air stadium in Florida is, have you ever been to Florida in July? 
Not in July, but yes, August, it's very whatever. Hot in I mean, you don't want to go outside. You cannot go outside. Mm -hmm. And so the I guess the idea I I'm thinking the idea, and I read one writer who sprouted this is that oh, the, in, during the super hot summer months in Florida, that's where the games will be played in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And in the super cold months where baseball is still not suitable, which is you know April, and then I mean maybe and May, May or, or maybe maybe they're going to talk about September too. I don't know, like. That's when the games would be in Tampa. But like, Actually, th September is nice in Montreal. It is. It is. But I mean, that's this is like this is like pie in the sky stuff, you know. So yes, this is not going to work. And and I haven't even gotten to the point where like so the fans that live in Tampa are going to be pissed when the games are in Montreal, and vice versa. Actually, I don't think the fans in Tampa are going to be pissed at all because there are none. Okay, so if there are none, then there shouldn't be a team in Tampa at all. I know that they're only averaging fourteen thousand, and that's sold tickets. I don't know how many people actually come to the game. So there's diehards, and their team is good. It's not like their team sucks. Their team well, is good. Well, that's that's hold on. You stop on that point because the team is really good, and they're still drawing flies. Imagine yeah. because every team goes through cycles. Imagine when the team sucks, how mm -hmm. few how few people are going to go. Well, we went through that here, you know, when the Expos were doing good, because you know how Montreal is. It's of course. front runners. It's front runners. Like, there's, there's, I'm going to insult all our listeners who are a lot of Montrealers, but like, it's a front running city, you know? When the team's doing well, everybody's on the bandwagon. When the team's doing lousy, it's, it's the diehards. And then in the old, I don't want to rehash what happened with the Expos franchise. There wasn't a season ticket base to fall back on during the times when the team wasn't doing well. So then that's why you saw 10,000 people in the crowd, right? You led to you you alluded to something else that is annoying me. So forget about this whole, you know, cockamamie idea. Is that the right use of the word cockamamie? I, <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Is that a bad word? I think it's okay. Okay. The other thing that annoys me about this, more than the idea itself, is yeah. now you're hearing all these news reports coming out of, you know, the United States and here in Toronto and these people know nothing about the city of Montreal or what happened with the Expos. None of them. They're all clueless. How many people did I have to correct in my office just two days ago when this story first broke? Right. Oh, well, you know, you guys lost your team because no one went to the games. Why did no one go to the games? Because, and I want to state this for the record, because the league owned the team. The league ran the team into the ground. The league did not sign any free agents. The league traded away all their good players. The league was basically daring the fans, we dare you to go to the game. And so no one went to the game. All this after the league voted to contract the team. Right. I had, right? To, tell the, I had to tell sto that story to people also. People in my office had no clue about any of this. And by the way, you can give a big um, middle finger to all the, your co-workers in Toronto who are Jays fans and to the Jays organization who didn't even try to step in as the other Canadian team at the time to try to, hey, maybe contraction is not a great idea. Maybe we could do, they didn't, they didn't even, I, I believe they just abstained from voting. No, they didn't actually, vote against actually, contraction. Actually, I think they voted to, to contract Four. the Expos. Yes. Yeah, I think, I, I wasn't 100% sure of that. Yeah. And, and I did mention that to my Toronto yeah. colleagues oh, and none of them were aware of any of this no they don't know anything come on only the people who lived through the whole thing me and you and a bunch of other diehards know the whole story you know I and I encourage anybody who doesn't know to read the Jonah Carey's book up up and away because yes. it'll explain to you everything it will I and I recommended that book to a few people it'll explain to you the good times and the bad times so so this whole thing is very frustrating now um, we talked about this on this show, I think two years ago. Yeah. I sent you an audio clip yesterday to remind you, we were going to maybe use it in the show. We maybe, maybe we still will. Um, episode 30 of our show. And by the way, this is episode 146. That <laughs> so a that's a lot of ago. long time ago. It's from March 31st, 2017 was the episode released. And I asked you at the time, because there was a, this is when like the bring back the Exos movement was sort of starting and, and the Expos were playing, the Expos, I keep saying that. Yeah. The Jays were playing their preseason games in Montreal. And, you know, and always around that time, um, there's a, a fervor, kind of a, a lot of nostalgia about the old Expos and bringing them back. And, and at that time, there was um, news reports coming out saying that the, there was a new ownership assembled and the, the bring back the Expos movement was kind of moving forward. And I asked you at that time, what was the chance, 
what are what is what percent chance do you give the Expos of ever returning to Montreal or baseball ever returning to Montreal? And I said five percent, and you said maximum five percent, maybe less. Yeah. <laughs> so I ask you now, today, in 2019, June 22nd of 2019, what percent chance do you give the Expos? Uh, returning or baseball returning to Montreal. Now, are you asking on a full time, a full time team? Full time team. Five percent. Still five percent. Still five percent. I'm not any more optimistic today than I was two years ago. And, and in fact, in fact, this crazy idea, I think yeah. this this lessens the chances of Montreal getting a full time team. I think I would give it. I think I'd go as high as like fifty percent at this point. Maybe that's crazy. Maybe not. that's the maybe that's the optimist in me. Because I've seen like what's happened with that movement in the last two years, which is you know they they've they bought a piece of land, they actually have plans for a stadium drawn up, um, they say they have ownership in place, and and every time now I'm gonna preface this by saying like I'm gonna rebut my own thing by my own statement, but you know every time that Major League Baseball talks about expansion or relocation, Montreal always comes up, so. It seems that if there ever was an opportunity for a new a franchise to move or a franchise to um, like an expansion team awarded, it would be Montreal because that seems to be like on Major League Baseball's mind. But now I go back to what you said. I, I believe that a lot of the times when the Expos, when Montreal is mentioned, it's a ploy. <laughs> it's a pressure tactic. And we lived through that when we had the team. By people telling us, oh, we're going to move you to Tampa. Tampa's waiting for a team. Or so-and-so city's waiting for a team. Las Vegas is waiting for a team. If you guys don't start showing up, we're going to, you know, you're going to lose the team. Like, we, we've heard all that before, you know. Washington's waiting for the team, right? They're waiting to take your team away. And it, it happens. But, it, I mean, it doesn't happen. That type of stuff. They don't want to do that. They want the, they want it to work in their existing markets, right? So, yes, every time baseball- they mention Montreal, it's it's pressure. Regular season baseball games should never be played in the state of Florida. Period. A hundred percent true. Well, Florida is a terrible sports uh, market for fans. It's it's awful, um, especially for baseball. Like they've never supported either team. Um, the Marlins have had success on the field, but that was basically different circumstances in terms of buying team, buying free agents, and then you know selling teams immediately right after. Um, but but they have not supported either team. They have a brand new stadium in Miami for the Marlins. No one goes. <laughs> right? I can't believe that owner, and I'm not going to say his name intentionally, but I can't believe that owner suckered the Miami City Council into paying for that monstrosity of a stadium. There's a lot of anger, actually, in the city of Miami and the state of Florida over that the fact that that ballpark exists and who ended up paying for it, basically. So I have to say a couple of things. Mm. As a fan, I would love it if the Montreal Expos came back. No, of course, I know, I know. Of course, I know. However, you know. however, um, any city that doesn't currently have a baseball stadium or a football yeah. stadium or a hockey arena or a basketball facility, whatever, any city that doesn't currently have one should never build one because these things always end up losing money. It's right. it's it's not a good business proposition for the city or the province or in, in in the United States state instead of province. It's not a good business proposition because you're putting so much money into this building. And I mean, let's assume you don't have the problems that the Olympic Stadium had, even Ugh. if you don't have those issues, even if the building is on time and on budget, it still costs billions of dollars, which taxpayers are paying for years. Yeah. It doesn't make any financial sense to do this. Well, ownership groups have basically bullied levels of government um into financing stadiums. This happened this happened over and over and they've used the argument that all the money that's being spent is going to be recouped because it's going to have such a boom on the economy, the local economy, tourism and all. Like th- there's a litany of uh there's a list of like reasons that they said that are going to basically they're going to be secondary factors. You know, they're going to be all these factors are going to going to help the local economy as offshoots of this multi-billion, you know, hundred million dollar project. And I'll send you a link because I read about it this morning. There's studies already that have shown because now time has passed 
and they can actually measure the effects on the economy in these cities where all this economic booms were promised. And it's been proven that it's not true. So when I tell you before that local governments are not going to fall for this anymore, it's because if they do their homework, they're going to find out that, no, it doesn't have the effect on the economy that they that these uh, baseball owners have been promising. It's just it. the whole thing is billionaires not wanting to spend their own money. <laughs> <laughs> and and kind of holding cities hostage, you know. You want your team here, you better pay. Right. Like if if there happens to be an owner who has you know bucket loads of money who wants to pay for his or her own stadium, by mm-hmm. all means, go ahead, knock yourself out. Yeah. But to build a thing like that, there's no there's no owner that can afford to do that. First of all, without the help of the province or the city or any of that. You're talking about an owner in Montreal. An owner in any well, city. Well, I mean, there are there are owners in cities. No, but that even have if you take that dude who owns funds. the Clippers, what's his name? Balmer, Steve Balmer, who's a billionaire. Yeah. yeah. He couldn't build his own stadium. He doesn't he have enough could, money to do that. He could he could finance it and get the money. They could build it. They could build it. But he's not writing a check for five hundred million dollars. And even if he does, he's stupid, which he wouldn't do. That's why he's that's why he's Steve Ballmer and he has all that money because he doesn't write checks for five hundred million dollars. Well, he overpaid right. for the Clippers, but that's another story. Yeah, that's another story. In any case, um, so it doesn't make sense. As much as I would love to see the Expos come back, it doesn't make financial sense for the city or the province to agree to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say this. The population of Montreal Mm -hmm. is, if you put it with all the 30 teams that have, the 30 cities that have a Major League Baseball team, Mm -hmm. if you ranked Montreal, I think they'd be, if not in the top 10, just outside the top 10. It's like 4 million metro area. There's many, many cities that are smaller. Right. So, I mean, there's enough people that live in the city to support a major league team. That's well, not it's the, the biggest, question. It's the biggest city that doesn't have a team. Right. I mean. So there's enough people, but that's not even the question. Because how many of these people actually like baseball? How many will go to baseball? The stadium needs to be, if you're going to do this, it needs to be in a place that's convenient for people to go. Because the mm-hmm. minute you say, oh, well, you have to drive here, you have to take this bus or this subway or whatever... Yeah. Then people are going to be like, ah, I just don't feel like going. What's what's good about here in Toronto, the stadium is right in the heart of downtown. So when you're done work, you could just w- walk out of your office and literally walk to the stadium. It's so convenient. So even if you don't have tickets one day, you're like, oh, there's a game tonight. Maybe I'll go to the game. And there's a lot of cities where their stadiums right. are in the core of the downtown area. So I don't know where the, this this potential Montreal ownership group has purchased land. Is it is it Place Saint Henry? I don't even know. It's it's called the Peel or, Basin. So sorry, it's Point like, Saint Charles or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's adjacent to downtown. But I mean the you know, I mean where do you find a, a huge plot of land in a downtown, you know? That's right, not easy to right. find, you know? Adjacent so, to refuse is refuse. Is, yeah. I mean the, the 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 location seems fine. I mean I think it seems fine and I think I think uh, the it, the team would be supported if it come back, especially on the short term, because like you said, there's so like I said before, there's so much nostalgia. There's a lot of history of baseball here, so there is a core group of fans are ready to to jump on on a new team here. It, but, the, the thing is, like, what happens after five years when they're in last place? Do the do the fans stop showing up? That's that's where that's where we will eventually answer this question of can Montreal support baseball? That's when that question will be answered to your coworkers. What you were saying before. Never mind five years. Let me ask you a question. If yeah. you found out that the Montreal Expos were coming back full time, not half Tampa, half Montreal. Yeah. You know there's 81 home games a year. Yeah. You're you're one of the diehard fans, I would say. Yeah. How many games do you think you're gonna go to? Twenty. Twenty. You I don't even think you would go to that many games because you don't have time to go to twenty games. <laughs> Like when you were, when we were in university, we could go to 25, 30 games a year because what else did we have to do? Yeah. You're, you're a parent now, you have kids, you have yeah. responsibilities, you have a full-time job. Okay. So you let also me, don't let live me, anywhere me... near the stadium. So you, I don't know if you would even go to 20 games. So let me rephrase that. Maybe 10 to 20. I'm just, so, and you're a diehard. So how is, how is, how are they going to sell out 81 games if you're only going to 10 games? Even if you know. even if you went to twenty games, it's not for me to to, to worry about that. It's not for you, <laughs> absolutely. I agree. I'm just saying there's so many yeah. there's so many issues with this. And okay, I need to shift gears a little bit. Another thing that's annoying me about this entire story. So of course, when this news came out, all the uh, 
other co-workers of mine in the office. They started to debate all these things, you know. And then and then one guy said, okay, let me name you my all-time Expos team. Oh, okay. my Lord. This guy, he's been to a few Expos games, but he grew up in Toronto. He starts right. naming players. I'm not even going to tell you who he's naming. And okay. I'm like, okay, you have no business naming an all-time Expos team. You're, you're leaving out so many players, by the way, that should totally be on this team. So now... Now, we are going to devote, not today, but you and I, you have to do your homework. We're going to devote one entire episode this summer. Mm-hmm. You're going to come up with your all-time Expos team, and I'm going to do the same. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put the caveat in there, because we've already, I already know this in my head. Uh, Larry, don't, Walker's don't, not don't, uh, no Larry Walker's not eligible at first base. I'm just telling you. That's fine. Because there's not... a lot of all-Expos teams that come out, and because... There's no other obvious first baseman. He ends up there, and because they, because uh, the people want to fill it, there's too many outfielders, right? So I'm just telling you that right now. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. No spoilers, and you're allowed to have, you're allowed to have a DH. Ah, there we go. That's good. One okay. DH. One DH. Okay. All right. Let's do that. I can't wait. Yeah. Not today. Is that next episode? No, no. We it's it's gonna take me a while to do all my homework. <laughs> I don't know when we'll do it, but we'll do it. Okay. Okay. I think I got. Most of that stuff off my chest. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Do you want to switch sports? Sure. Okay. There was so, a, two big events this week. I don't know which one you want to look at first. The N- NBA draft or the NHL draft last night. And this is interesting because a week or two ago, you said to me, what are we going to talk about? There's so much to talk about. Well, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. The off seasons are fun in all the sports, but also this expos return Tampa Ray story just got dumped on us, gave us 20 good minutes to talk about it. <laughs> right? It would have been better if this happened a month from now when we had nothing to talk about. But anyway, let's, I actually, even though I'm a bigger hockey fan than basketball, I'm actually more interested in the NBA draft. The National Basketball Association. Well, the NBA draft, the problem with the, look, look, do you want to, Let's let's start with the NBA draft. But like the difference between the NHL and the NBA draft, the NHL, you, how many guys did you actually know in the NHL draft? The first, the first guy that was the picked. first, and I knew the second guy because I heard about him there. Like, yeah, maybe I maybe I might have heard his name during the World Junior Championships. Th- that's it. And the problem is, it's because you don't get to see these guys play in a high profile event. Whereas the NBA draft, all those guys, with the exception of one or two. All played in the NCAA tournament, which is a huge, ho- high-profile, televised, you know, the event that everybody's watching, right? So the whole, like, all the North American sports culture is watching that N- NCAA tournament. And then we all found out who is Ja Morant and and Jared Culver and Carson Edwards and, like, you know, th- these guys, right? So anyway, so did you watch the NBA draft? I did watch the NBA draft, yes. I mean, I, I didn't watch it fully, but I watched the beginning because I wanted to see their names being called. I mean, it was the most anticlimactic draft. Everybody knew who was going where. There was no surprises, you know? Well, because like you've said about the NBA a million times, any rumors that you hear actually come true. So you knew everything that was going to happen before it happened. Yeah, that's what, true. What annoys me, and yeah, how many things have annoyed me on this on this podcast today? What annoys me about the NBA draft, when a pick is traded... Oh, it's the, so stupid. The team it's that, so stupid. The team that originally had the pick still makes the pick and then the guy has to go and wear the hat of a team that he's never going to play for it's so dumb even today this is two days after the draft i'm looking at a a website that has a list of the draft right Mm -hmm. so it goes one two three williamson john moran rj barrett then it says four lakers deandre hunter lakers are currently in discussion to trade this pick with the pelicans who reportedly will trade the pick to the hawks like what the hell and then, so like, there's there's half the picks, almost half the picks in the first round are actually players being picked by other teams that are going to get traded. And everybody knows, everybody knows who they're getting traded to. Yet somehow the NBA can't put their rubber stamp on them. Like, I don't understand why these trades can't be approved before the draft so that players could go up there and and, and actually be drafted by the team they're going to play for. And put on the right hat. The hats are so stupid. By the way, did you see Kobe White's oh, put on the hat? Let me tell you. This is, look, I want to read you my note here that I that I that I wrote about that. Yeah. The most interesting part of the draft. It was not like who was going to get picked by who and and where was yeah, this guy yeah. going to go. The most interesting yeah. part for me was when I heard Kobe White's name being called. I said to myself, "Oh my God, 
he won't be able to put that hat on his head. It's not going to fit. They tried. They tried. And and that was the most interesting thing for me. He has fantastic hair, by the way. Well, I don't know about fantastic. No, it is. But, <laughs> but but I mean, there's no, you can't, there's no hat that can fit on top of it. But did you see the picture of them putting the hat? Like, they carefully placed it on his giant hair? You need those clips, like when uh, when you go to shul and you have a clip for your kippah. That's, <laughs> That's what, what you need. need. That's what you need. So, I mean, I love the fact that Zion was so kind of, He's like a bit of an open book in terms of his personality. You know, we got to see him crying and he was so happy and he kind of embraced the the city of New Orleans and they're embracing him. And I just think it's a great story. I'm really, I mean, New Orleans is going to be my new favorite team now. Okay, well. You know, um, just because of him. Then plus they have Brandon Ingram, you know, and I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I just, I just, I hope they do really well. I, hope, I just hope they do really well. I do too. I might, I might start to like the Knicks. The Knicks. Well, look, I love and like, look. R.J. Barrett's uh, was a great college player in his one year. I mean, he people always look at all his faults and are like, "Oh, he doesn't pass." He doesn't. The guy averaged twenty two points a game in his freshman season in college. Like, what the hell do you want? What more do you want from this guy? You know, <laughs> and I think he has a potential to be a tremendous NBA player. His shooting has to improve a little or more than a little significantly but i think that's something that can happen but the problem with the with him is the Knicks are a disaster they are but hopefully hopefully they can change that i mean I, they, they got rid of all the um what do you call it the deadwood if you will yeah, but the Deadwood is guys that they already assembled from the first rebuild. You know, like, what's, what's, I'm going to give you a scenario. And I hope RJ Barrett becomes a franchise player, plays his whole career on the Knicks, and the Knicks become good with RJ Barrett as their star. This is what I hope. But in three years, after two straight years of booing Barrett because he can't hit threes, right? Mm-hmm. They trade him. Like, the, that's a much more probable situation. And then he goes along. Then, after three years, he becomes a star somewhere else. That's a much more probable, likely scenario. Well, the Knicks need to do what the Philadelphia 76ers did. Yeah. They need to, you know, be rock bottom for a few years, get a bunch of high draft picks. It hasn't worked. And be they patient. have been already. Josh, do you understand? No, but the Knicks, they, the but Knicks they... have the worst record in the NBA cumulatively over the last 18 seasons there's no team worse than the knicks over the past 18 seasons so who who think about who's that? making their draft picks se- i don't know hope i have no idea but it's not working you know mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever they're doing is not working you know so um Let's well, I mean, they look, they had Porzingis, and then everybody, look, what, what happened, what I just described about R.J. Barrett, it, didn't that just happen with Porzingis? They had him, he was great, he was like the face of the franchise, everyone's saying they're going to rebuild around this guy, then they got rid of him. But was he great? Well, for one season, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, then he got injured, and then next thing you know, it's like, ah, uh, I don't know if we can rebuild around him. Okay, you well, know? this isn't a Knicks podcast, so I do want to talk no, about Duke a little bit. Podcast. Sure, sure. Um, so originally Javin Delorier said he was opting into the draft. And then about a month ago, he changed his mind and said, he's not going into the draft and he's returning to Duke, which I I was happy to hear that. He would not have been drafted. No, he would not have been. But there was another player, Mark, Marquise Bolden. Yeah. He did opt into the draft. He did not opt out. Yeah. He didn't get drafted. However, I don't know if you heard that after the draft, he was signed by the Cleveland Cavaliers. Well, a lot of, that happens to a lot of players um, that they they know they're not going to get drafted or teams approach them and say, hey, if you're not drafted, we're going to sign you. But that, that, that they usually sign these guys to two-way deals, meaning the G League option. You know, he's not guaranteed his spot. Mm-hmm. Um, a guy that I followed in the NCAA tournament, the Montrealer, um, Luke Gens Dort. So he didn't get drafted either. Um, there was a lot of, he was like, I read, I read, I looked at mock drafts where he was drafted in the first round. And then I looked at others where he was drafted in the second round and others where he wasn't drafted at all. And then he wasn't drafted, but then he did sign a contract with the Oklahoma city, I believe. So, okay. Yeah, that happens. I mean, I'm a little disappointed that Bolden isn't going to be back at Duke next year. He's not an NBA player. Let's, I mean, come on. Well, I mean, obviously he wasn't even drafted in the draft. So, you know, he'll be a fringe player. Yeah, I mean, the only reason why he could be an NBA player is because he's big. 
And right. also Cleveland, they just need players. Well, Cleveland's they have just, nobody. Cleveland's a mess. I mean, so what are you gonna? Cleveland's Cleveland's been a mess like for our entire lives. They haven't been good except when they had LeBron James. That's it. Right. Well, there was a few years there with the Mark Price, Brad Doherty. Like they had some decent teams, but I mean, I have no clue who you're talking about now. <laughs> this is in the '80s. You I, know, know Mark I know. Price? I didn't follow the NBA in the '80s. Yeah. but I, I barely mean, follow like, it now. They had some good teams there, but I mean, generally they've just been a sad sack franchise that lucked into LeBron James, and uh, and then and then all of a sudden became relevant, and then it's the second he left, they sucked. You know, that's the beauty of the NBA because it's like there's a lot of teams now that could all of a sudden teams that are normally lousy that could all of a sudden become good, like the Brooklyn Nets, you know, mm. or uh, or like the Clippers now. Let's say if wherever Durant goes, basically, you know. Well, he's not playing next year, so. No, but I'm. But I would all. According to what I'm reading, is that teams are going to be willing to bite the bullet on one year of paying him. I'm surprised. I'm very surprised. I know I heard the same stories, but I'm very surprised to hear that. Well, it's the way of enticing him because if let's say another team is like, well, we'll sign you. We're going to wait to sign you when you're healthy, you know. And it only takes one team to say, hey, we'll pay you regardless. Oh if, yeah, we, and and know. there will be a team that will do it. I I have no doubt. There'll and it's be a at least risk. one team it's, that will pay him for a, a huge... full year without him having to play. And it's a huge risk because you don't know if he's coming back fully healthy exactly. with that injury. He, well, he's not going to be the same player he was. I mean, no. it's just that doesn't happen. The good thing about him is um, even if he loses like a lot of his athleticism because of this Achilles injury, meaning like jumping and speed and whatever, he's still a great shooter. <laughs> so like at wor- worst case scenario, you have a guy that stands in the corner that hits threes, right? I guess, but you do need to get open. You do need to get open. This is true. Anyway, yeah. I'm I'm done with basketball unless you have anything else. No, I just I like the NBA draft. The 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 fact that they can't approve the trades in time for the draft is stupid. So stupid. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And uh and I just hope Zion does great. I hope Barrett does great. I don't know, Cam Reddish, where did he go? Brooklyn maybe or I forget who who drafted Cam Reddish? I don't remember, actually. I thought that was Atlanta, no? Oh, yeah. Well, he's... Yeah, Atlanta, I think. Yeah. Although, I mean, yeah. he wore the Atlanta hat. Doesn't mean he's going to play for them. Yeah, no, he was drafted by Atlanta without a trade. He's actually drafted by Atlanta. It's a good fit for him. Atlanta's the kind of an up-and-coming team, you know? The National Hockey League. By the way, breaking news. We're going to switch to hockey now. Mm-hmm. And I have breaking news. Yeah. Y- you heard it here first. Patrick Marlowe was just traded to the Carolina Hurricanes. That's a salary trade, basically. The Leafs are desperate to get rid of salary, and the Marlowe, everyone kind of knew that he was going to be moved, right? I don't understand why the Leafs haven't uh, already signed Mitch Marner. I mean, you saw what happened last year with Nylander, and you would think that Mm -hmm. they would want to get this done and wrapped up as quickly as possible and not give any other team an opportunity to to offer him an offer sheet and yet you know free agency is in just over a week and uh, the Mm -hmm. Leafs don't seem to be in a rush to sign this guy I don't I don't understand everything I read everything I read is that he's asking for a number that the Leafs are not comfortable with which is basically the same salary as Austin Matthews and why doesn't he deserve the same exact salary as Austin Matthews? He does, but I don't know if they can fit it. Like, they, I guess they're trying to look at their their salary structure. They 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 made one big mistake, which is they overpaid for Nylander. They played hardball with Nylander, and then they gave in. <laughs> and now they're in a situation with Marner, who's actually their best player. Yes, I mean, he is. I know people. No, no, no. I, mean, I agree with statistically, you. Statistically, statistically, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Maybe maybe Matthews went fully healthy and everything is better, but. Um, it's going to be interesting because he's going to get an offer sheet. I, I, I feel confident in that. I don't know. The last time there was an offer sheet was like five years ago, I think. It doesn't happen often because it's like the, with the number that he's going to get, um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be big. It's four first round picks, right? Yeah. Compensation. Who wants to give that up? But you're saying it's on the Leafs side, but maybe it's on Marner's side that the deal's not done in in that he wants to wait to July 1st. Uh, it's always in the best interest of the player to wait to July 1st. Uh, yes and no. I don't know. I mean... When you hit the open market, all of a sudden your price goes up. Now, and then what if offer sheets come? Okay, right? but a guy like Marner, who born and raised in Ontario, you think would want to stay with the Leafs. That's what, that's what all Leafs fans are telling themselves. Mm. 
But, you know, you know what happens in the end. The, the money talks, right? Right. So I can't talk about the NHL draft because I don't know any of the players, but I actually want to talk, and I know you didn't watch, I want to talk about the NHL awards. I watched a little bit. So a few, a few interesting things happened during the NHL awards. Hmm. I don't know if you saw the um, the touching moment when Carey Price, everyone thought he was on a video call from somewhere else, and then all of a sudden he, he comes on stage. There was a little boy who had met yes. Carey Price during the season. The boy's yes. mom passed away a few months ago. Yeah. It's incredibly um, emotional. It was Yeah, it was unbelievable. So Last week I told you if you don't get an emotional about Layla Anderson and the her story with the Blues, that you're not from planet Earth and you should go back to your planet. I mean, this is even more. No? Right, yes. Yeah. It was a very touching moment. Yeah, Carey Price is a class act. I mean, you can say what you want about his goaltending or his contract or his performance, but the guy's a class act, you know? Now, um, if you did see that whole uh, part of the show, mm-hmm. you would know that the uh, the girl that, that introduced the boy and, and yeah. brought him on stage, she, I think, is on the cover of the swimsuit issue. I didn't know who she was. Okay. Well, she's on the cover of the swimsuit issue. So okay. I'm inclined to like her because of that. However, yeah. however, it turns out she's a Bruins fan. So now I'm torn. <laughs> so I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, whatever. You can still you can still get the swimsuit issue and forget what team she roots for. Okay, the other thing, this is the best part of the whole awards show. Um, I don't know, did you see when Alexander Barkov went up to accept his award? I did not see. Okay, so Alexander Barkov went up to accept his award. He's he's um English isn't his first language, but he speaks English. Right. And so the first thing he said when he got up on stage and 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 accepted his award is Oh, there's more fans from Finland here than Florida. Oh, boy. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Well, he's like, he's being honest about his franchise, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, he knows, he knows, he, he's there. Have you, you saw some of the clips of the games in Florida this year. Yeah, except like, when Montreal basically, Toronto plays there. Basically empty. Yeah. Empty arenas. These but guys, I mean, are, play- I these guys believe, are playing for empty arenas. Because you know, these players, especially hockey players... They're like, they're told what they can and can't say. And they give, yeah, they give you sure. the same cliches all the time. And then and he hockey goes up players, there and says this. Yeah. It was hilarious. Hockey players are very conservative by nature. A lot of Canadian kids, European. Mm. And uh, they don't usually say controversial stuff, right? It's just, they don't even have to be taught. They just don't, you know? The, the thing is, the fans in Florida may never even hear that he said that. They probably, you're right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. If a tree falls in the forest... Does anybody hear? Speaking yeah, I don't of the know. draft, did you hear that in 2020, the draft's going to be in Montreal? I did hear that. Mm. It's exciting news, no? It is. Well, I don't know. And maybe uh, the per- the one of the top picks is a Quebec player, uh, Alexis Lafreniere. Oh, you know the Canadians are going to be pressured into picking him. Well, they're not going to because you're going to have to get like one of the top two picks probably to get this guy. Oh, you know? okay. I don't really have any other hockey stuff. I mean, I don't either. The draft is... Uh, I didn't watch it. I just followed it on my phone to see who was being picked. And there wasn't normally... I mean, the big story about the draft is that normally there's a lot of trades that happen the draft day and during the draft and players moving and, and, and people were anticipating a lot of stuff happening, especially with all the Leafs players, not just Marner, you know, well, you've heard about Marlowe today, but Kasperi Kapanen, Nazem Kadri, these guys are all rumored to be being moved. Um, there's other big names that are on the trade block. Hold the phone. Yeah. H- huge you're breaking up. news. Huge breaking yeah. news. Yeah. Are you looking at your phone? No. Okay. Hold on. My phone is slow, so this is loading, but there's a report that PK Subban was just, was just traded to the New Jersey Devils. I was just about to say the next name that was coming out of my mouth was that PK Subban is, uh, is on the trade block, which is, he kind of knew it. He even said it in his end of year press conference saying, look, I understand the business of hockey. And I think he kind of knew that he might be the odd man out there because they're loaded on defense. They don't need him. And well, good for him. I mean, we'll see him back in the Eastern Conference again. That's true. But yeah. look, Subban's a good player. Is he? Uh, the, and the Devils now have the fir- oh, first overall pick the last two years. So, I mean, we we saw Nico Heischer a little bit this year. He seems pretty good. I I guess Jack Hughes is going to play right away. 
and they have Taylor Hall, so they could be uh, they could be an up and coming team for sure in the Eastern Conference. Who knows? That's big. Yeah. Big news. Two trades during our show. Yeah, that well, never like just, happens. Well, like like I was just saying, like all the there's always lots of trades that happen day of the draft. It looks like maybe it's going to happen starting today and leading up to the July first, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm excited for the July first in hockey. It's always exciting to see who's going to sign where and what players might move, and especially this year, the Marner the Marner situation is is really intense. You know, <laughs> the only thing I'm excited about for July first is I'm hoping to go to a Canada Day barbecue. Are you invited to one? Well, there's the they 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 do one here. Like anyone can go. Um, it's at the park, not far from where I live. Who does it? The city, like the town. Yeah, the city puts it on. You know, you can go. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna go? I might go. Why not? If it's a nice day and it's not raining, sure. <laughs> why? Why would I turn down a free burger? Why not? <laughs> why not? Before we sign off, remember, you can listen and subscribe to new and archived episodes of the Skip and Josh podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and of course, Spotify. If you listen to the show through Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. We would love to hear from you via email, skipandjoshshow at gmail.com, via Twitter at Skip and Josh, or by liking and following our Facebook page. As always, you can get all the links to everything I just talked about on our website, skipandjosh.com. We leave you with this. So I, I know we don't talk about fantasy baseball a lot. Do, do you have, who has in your fantasy baseball Nomar Mazara of the Texas Rangers? I don't know. Why do you ask? Well, um, last night he hit um, a home run that was um, estimated at 505 feet. Which is the longest home run um, since they well since they've been tracking um, home run lengths, which is only since 2015. But it's the longest, basically, since they've been tracking how long homers are going. This is the longest home run ever at 505 feet. I'm 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 surprised that they've only been tracking it since 2015 because I I would have thought that I would have guessed that they started before that. I think the ones before that are officially unofficial, sort of. They're they're more estimates of the length based on whatever. But th- now they have this thing called Statcast, which mm-hmm. supposedly tracks the home runs accurately. But the, the the did you hear like all around this same story is that Rob Manfred sort of admitted that maybe the ball's juiced. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we've known that. We've known that. Yeah. He alluded to the fact that there's something inside the ball that's uh, not increasing or decreasing the drag. Like, I don't want to get into physics. Maybe we'll get a physicist on the show but do <laughs> to explain. But uh, I just thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. But, I mean, how long do you think that record's going to hold up? How many more home runs this year will be more than 505 feet? The record's going to last about a week until someone breaks it. I agree. By the time we get to the end of the year, this this home run will be 10th on the list. Do you know what's interesting about home runs? So obviously home runs are up. Home runs are up this year. They were up last year. Every year they go up. However, remember back in the day when Barry Bonds was hitting 70 home runs? Yeah. You don't see any one player hitting 70 or even 60 or even 50 home runs anymore. So overall home runs are up. But the the guy who leads in homers usually has like 40 something I, I, I can't I can't recall anyone hitting the 50 mark in the last I don't know five years or more maybe even 10 it, no 10 no because there's guys that have been in the 50s I'm pretty sure but uh, you're right you're right what does that say all that tells me is that I think the everybody it's all spread out it's spread out but it's like Players that normally are not home run hitters, let's say they're not their body type and their swing is just not based on power. Typically, middle infielders or center fielders, speedy guys. Like now, players that are coming up through high school, college, double AA, A, triple A, everybody wants to hit the dingers, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So batting averages are low, strikeouts are up, and home runs are up. So a guy like that might be like a speedy center fielder. He might just hit, he's going to hit 25 home runs now instead of hitting 10, but his batting average is going to be 230 instead mm-hmm. of 280, right? Yeah. When you when you mentioned fantasy baseball a couple minutes ago, I thought you were going to ask me, who has Frankie Montas? <laughs> who has him? Well, so Frankie Montas, he's having a phenomenal season. He's a pitcher for the Oakland A's. Yeah. He's, I mean, well, he was going to be an all-star. 
Right. Um, and you know, if they had to pick a Cy Young winner today, yeah. it wouldn't might not be him, but he's in the he's in the discussion. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, they just announced yesterday that he's been suspended for 80 games for taking performance enhancing drugs. There you go. So he's not going to be on the All Star team, and he's not going to win the Cy Young award. <laughs> And more importantly, he's on my fantasy team. You got screwed. And so if that wasn't bad enough, last year I had Roberto Osuna, who also Same got suspended thing. for a different reason, but he got yeah. suspended. So he it seems like time. every year I get stuck with someone who gets suspended. Anyway. You got to get your scouting staff, uh, your fantasy scouting How staff. How was I to... supposed to know Roberto Osuna was going to go hit somebody? Yeah. How do you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, talk to you next time, and I hope next week you'll be uh, you won't have so much uh, anger towards a lot of people. Okay, we'll see. You'll be, you'll get zen. We'll you'll, see. You'll find peace. Yeah. We will see. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>